All right, I am excited for the opportunity to look at two more spiritual gifts that God has given to individuals within the body of Christ, the church. The two we will be looking at today might look like an odd pairing, but the two can work very well together. And quite often, the individual who has one of these gifts might have both of them, even though they are distinctly different, and even though you don't have to have one to have the other. So let's start with teaching or teacher. But before we break down this biblical definition of the gift, when you look back at your time in school, whether it was during grade school, middle school, high school, or college, who was the best teacher or teachers that you had? And if you'd like to give them a shout out, you can put their name and, and what you really loved about them in the comment section of the video. I just wanna know, what made them such a special teacher to you? Now the answers that I received to this question always varies. Sometimes it will be because a special bond was created between the student and the teacher. They genuinely cared for me, I hear quite often. They were such a nice teacher, they went above and beyond. They took a subject that I didn't care for and they made it enjoyable. They had such passion in the subject they taught, which was just contagious. Or perhaps I, I had them during a rough patch in my life and they were there to encourage me. Perhaps this favorite school teacher that you had has the gift of leadership or the gift of serving. And in their job of teaching, it was evident that God had blessed them with the gift of leadership or the gift of serving or some other spiritual gift. I had an English teacher that was passionate about the subject that she taught and her passion carried over into my life and they cultivated in me the love of writing. They had the gift of encouragement. Before anyone gets mad at me, I want to clarify that spiritual gifts are only given to believers for believers to encourage, to edify, and to build up the body. A spiritual gift is a supernatural, God-given ability to perform a ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. The examples I used were assuming that the teachers that we talked about are believers and showing how their profession teaching is a platform where their spiritual gifts are seen. Those gifts are evident in their life. And perhaps God will use those gifts in spectacular ways to lead others to faith in Christ. Now, however, I fully realize that your favorite teacher may or may not be a Christian. It's so interesting to me because in those examples I used, if the teacher was a believer, notice how I didn't say that they had the spiritual gift of teaching. Most teachers in a public school setting do not have the spiritual gift of teaching. Again, let me explain why that is as we take a closer look at the biblical definition for teaching. Teaching, teacher, in the New Testament is one who teaches concerning the things of God and the duties of man, Ephesians 4.11, 1 Corinthians 12.28. Based on this definition, it is entirely possible that someone who has a spiritual gift of teaching might teach in the public school system, but usually not because teaching math or science or any other subject doesn't allow for them to use their spiritual gift, whereas some of the other spiritual gifts might. Like I said, with the gift of encouragement, serving, or any other gifts that might be seen in the life of a school teacher. I laugh because I went with Diane as she was switching schools from Oakland University to Wayne State, and there was information on the wall that said if you had so many college credits, you could be a substitute teacher. Now, we were actually considering it for Diane before she became a teacher, and the administrator who was helping her get her credits transferred from one school to the other uh, actually asked me about my education. And they said, you know, you could be a substitute teacher. I, I laughed out loud, and although I teach every week, the prospect of teaching a subject where I can't teach things concerning God it doesn't interest me because I can't use my spiritual gift in this way. Now, it's rare that you'll find someone 
with the spiritual gift of teaching as a school teacher. That might sound like a, a no-brainer, but I've gotten to know many church leadership staffs over the years, uh, partly because I belong to ministerial associations, pastoral conferences I've attended, local clergy meetings, etc. And almost without fail, when it comes to children's, youth, and college and career ministry, they share how they have a shortage of teachers in their church. They seem frustrated when they talk about it because they say, I don't get it. It's not like we have a shortage of public school teachers in our congregation. Well, do you know who should be the teachers in the church? The ones who have the spiritual gift of teaching, those who have the gift of teaching of the things of God, and not necessarily those who have been blessed with the, uh, the employment of teaching math or science or gym or any other class out there. It's completely different. We, we learn from Ephesians 4.11 and 1 Corinthians 12.28, Romans 12.7 and James 3.1, that people that, who have the spiritual gift of teaching are called to demonstrate God's love while revealing his truth to the world without fear. The effect of their ministry is the upholding of God's word and the growth and maturity of his bride until the day of his return. So I have the spiritual gift of teaching along with the spiritual gift of a word of knowledge. And I can't use that in my everyday life as a school teacher. It's been a compliment where people have said to me multiple times, well, you should be a substitute teacher uh, and you should substitute teach once in a while. Again, I take it as a compliment because they love my energy and they love the passion that I have for the word and the kindness and grace of the Lord is evident because I'm in Christ. But that does not translate for me into a desire to want to, want to or feel led to substitute teach. School teachers probably don't have the spiritual gift of teaching biblically. All the school teachers say, amen. They're like, stop giving me that side eye every time there's a mention of a volunteer opening to teach Sunday school class. I teach kids Monday through Friday every week. Now, do all pastors in the church have the gift of teaching? This involves a bit of a complex answer. To begin with, when I say pastor, I recognize that some churches have staffing with multiple pastors. Some churches will label a pastor who handles the business affairs of the church as an executive pastor. And there's many other positions that are similar where the duties don't involve teaching and preaching on Sundays. We're not going to include the business pastors of the church in this question, but we're only going to try to look at those who actually teach and preach on a regular basis. The question is, do those teaching the Word of God on Sunday, do they have the spiritual gift of teaching? When we dive a little deeper into what is, what is the gift of teaching, the spiritual gift of teaching is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All of them that we're covering in the series come to us by way of the Holy Spirit. So Romans 12 talks about this, 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4. It's a gift given by the Holy Spirit, enabling one to effectively communicate the truths of the Bible to others. It's most often, but not always, used in the context of the local church. The gift of teaching involves the analysis and proclamation of the Word of God, explaining the meaning, context, and application to the hearer's life. The gifted teacher is one who has a unique ability to clearly instruct and communicate knowledge, specifically the doctrines of the faith and truths of the Bible. And so when we understand that this, we could come to the conclusion that all pastors must be teachers, or all pastors must be given the spiritual gift of teaching. However, consider the following verse. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, shepherds would be pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Many assume that pastors slash shepherds and teacher are the same gift. They're not. They are clearly, from Ephesians 4, two separate gifts. 
those who hold this view that they are the same believe that it is the only dual gift among all the 19 that the Holy Spirit gives to the body. It's not true. And uh, if this was the case, all pastors would be teachers and all teachers would be pastors. Now, the Apostle Paul links these two gifts closely together, but it's better to regard pastors as a subset part of a larger group, teachers. In other words, all pastors are teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. A pastor still is a different gift or office than that of a teacher. Consequently, it is proper to conclude that all pastors are teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. Even though pastors teach, they do not necessarily have the spiritual gift of teaching. For instance, some pastors make excellent chaplains because they have the spiritual gift of mercy or even shepherding, and they excel at providing care to others. They still teach on Sunday, but if they could, if they could choose between the two, they would rather be bedside next to a parishioner than behind the pulpit. Now, I have the spiritual gift of teaching, which works well behind the pulpit, and I would prefer to be here teaching rather than being a chaplain, although I have participated in that, and there's been seasons in my life where I've done a lot of ministry within the hospital system. I've done some ministry in the jails and, and, and some other things as well. It's not my spiritual gift, but sometimes the Lord will open up uh, doors for us to, to minister in ways that are outside of our spiritual gifting. And so that, that's a good look at the spiritual gift of teaching. Now I want to go to our, our next gift, the spiritual gift of discernment. What is the gift of discernment? This is a gift that I think is misunderstood quite often at times too. I've even heard other believers claim to have this gift and try to use it to manipulate an outcome based upon a personal preference. Uh, a long time ago, in what seems like a galaxy far, far away, I was going to college to be a pastor. I was also helping a church at this time get started. I was helping plant a church. And I was at this one meeting where we're trying to plan all the details for the launch for the first Sunday that we'll ever have and going over every single detail, everything from the paint color for the walls to the type of toilet paper that we would purchase. And this meeting went on for hour after hour after hour. One person said, that they sensed God's desire was for the church to have a certain color of paint on the walls. They said that they had the spiritual gift of discernment. So it must be right that we follow their input. <laughs> it's absurd to think this is what it means to have the gift of discernment. That is the gift of human preference, and we all have that gift. The gift of discernment is not the spiritual gift to discern from God what color you should paint the walls or anything like that. So let's take a look into God's Word and see what God's Word teaches about this spiritual gift and how it would also be beneficial for someone who has the gift of teaching to also have the gift of discernment. Discernment, distinguishing of spirits, discerning judgment spirits, which could be evil, used of demons, or of the Holy Spirit. This means the ability to judge whether something is from God or not. It is a spiritual gift that God gives to believers in order to recognize lying spirits and to identify deceptive and erroneous doctrines. Maybe the best way to see the gift of discernment in action is to look at some biblical examples of this spiritual gift displayed in the New Testament. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. If you follow more in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, 
they die as a result of their sin. Their bizarre deaths have been debated for 2,000 years. People ask the question all the time, and I've been asked multiple times, why did they die? Did God kill them? Why did God kill them? Why is this story in the Bible? Am I supposed to learn something from it? Will God kill me if I lie? Hundreds of scriptures could be used to show you that God did not kill them for their sins, and I want to assure you that he's not going to kill you for yours. Here are three easy passages that let us know that God is not going to kill us for lying, although I do not recommend lying at all. Uh, in Psalm 103, 10, it tells us that God doesn't punish us as our sins deserve. Isaiah 53, 5 says, The punishment that brought us peace was on him, speaking of Jesus. And then, of course, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God is not counting people's sins against them. Ananias and Sapphira were con artists who came into the early church to try to deceive God's people financially. Peter, who displayed the gift of discernment in action, has the ability to meet a person and perceive if that person is hiding something, has good or evil intentions, or is trying to manipulate them or is lying. This is what is meant by being able to distinguish good from evil spirits. Like a good shepherd, the Lord protects his sheep from wolves that come to attack his sheep. God protects his flock with the gift of discernment used by Peter. This story should give you confidence that he is watching over you and protecting you from those who want to inflict harm. It's a story of God's protection. The gift of discernment is unique in that it is not something that is only exercised in a corporate church setting. In 1 John 4, 1, believers were, to, were exhorted to not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So let's look at another one that happens out in the missionary field. This one is subtle, but oh, so powerful. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. Now let me ask you, was there anything wrong with what she said? She was telling the truth, wasn't she? Paul and Silas were indeed servants of the Most High God, and they were proclaiming the way of salvation. I want you to see this. For many days, the girl kept saying, these men are, these men are, these men are. And this greatly annoyed Paul so much so that he cast a demon out of her. Acts chapter 16, verse 18. Why was Paul so annoyed? Because the girl was constantly putting the spotlight on Paul and Silas. The devil always wants us to put our attention on man instead of God. The discernment came that this was not of God. It was the demon inside of her trying to get them to exalt themselves instead of Jesus. Why is this gift so helpful for teachers? Because the devil is cunning and he tries to get the focus to go on ourselves instead of on Christ. He wants the biblical teacher to exalt themselves or their people and not Jesus Christ and not our Father God. I learned a long time ago, whenever you listen to a sermon, who is the hero in the story? If the teacher pastor has exalted themselves or the people within their de de denomination, the devil has done his dastardly job. You could also look at this from the other side because the devil likes to play both sides. If the devil isn't getting you to sing your own praises, exalt yourself and make you believe that you are the center of the universe, He'll come after you with condemnation through the law, 
that you are no good, that you are rotten. And how could God love you? A teacher who is teaching righteousness based off of our law-keeping ability is not teaching grace. So it helps to have the gift of discernment, whether it's from God or of our flesh or of the devil. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ, Colossians 2.8. The next verse tells us the gift of discernment we actually grow in. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. To have the spirit of discernment is to possess the ability to judge well. We get our English word aesthetic from the Greek word for discernment, meaning moral perception, insight, and the practical application of knowledge. The gift of discernment may not be one of your spiritual gifts, but we all have the ability to to discern whether something is according to the Word of God or not. And this ability only grows as you grow in the Word. The more time you spend receiving teaching in grace, the more you will be able to distinguish when someone is preaching the law. The way to tell if someone is preaching a counterfeit gospel, which is really no gospel at all, Paul would tell the Galatians is to know the gospel of grace. The way experts can spot fake currency is they study the real thing. And so it is with the gospel and with growing in our ability to distinguish between good and evil. The mature believer has moved beyond milk and is digging into the Word of God for more meat, is empowered by the Holy Spirit, and is more spiritually discerning than those who spend little to no time in the Word. Obviously, they are also more discerning than new believers in that they are able to distinguish good doctrine from evil. So the potential for growing your spiritual discernment comes when you spend time in the Word of God. We are all exhorted to be spiritually discerning. Acts chapter 17, verse 11, 1 John 4, 1. But some in the body of Christ have a unique ability to listen to a message preached and to know without a doubt that something was a little bit off. They know when someone is lying. They know when someone is trying to deceive them. I do not mean that they have received extra biblical revelations from God, but rather that they are so familiar with the Word of God that they can see right away when a doctrine or person goes against it. They diligently test the spirits and are spiritually discerning enough that they can rightly divide the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15. Those with the gift of discernment do not experience anything mystical. They do not see demons, have dreams, visions, or unusual manifestations that appear to them in that moment. The spiritual gift of discernment increases from time spent in the Word of God, but is already increased in certain people for the edification of the church. Now, normally I put up all the past definitions we have covered, but since we are already 11 gifts in and we are out of time, I recommend looking up the sermons and the spiritual gifts that I've already preached from that you want more info on in this series. We've progressed rapidly through this series, the spiritual gifts series. I'm excited for the spiritual gifts we have left, and this has been a true joy and a blessing to clarify what these gifts are to help you, through the Holy Spirit, discern what your spiritual gift is. And my prayer is that it'll be used for God's glory and the edification of the body of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in your word, looking at the spiritual gifts of teacher, teaching, and discernment. Lord, I thank you that you have blessed the church with people who have the spiritual gift of teaching. And Lord, I thank you that I've been able to, over the years, bring clarity while some have struggled with seeing people who have the profession as a teacher and thinking that that must be their spiritual gift and then being frustrated when they're not using that in the body of Christ. 
Um, just because somebody's employed as a teacher does not mean they have that spiritual gift of teaching. Those are completely different things. And so, Lord, I pray that this frees people and gives them insight into wisdom to find those who do have the spiritual gift of teaching to use those in the church for our edification. Lord, the gift of discernment has also been confused over the years, so I thank you for the clarity as we looked at the definition in the Greek as to what it is and how it has been used in history. We see that you protect your church by giving us all the ability to discern whether things are good or evil, but you give people, certain people within the church this spiritual gift where they are right away, like Peter was, able to identify whether something is from you or not. So Lord, I thank you that when the church is, uh, the members of the church are using their spiritual gifts, it is powerful. We are blessed as a result of, of using our gifts to benefit others and being benefited by other spiritual gifts. Lord, I continue to pray for those who do not know what their spiritual gift is, that the Holy Spirit will reveal it to them and that they will use it for your glory and the building of the body. We give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.